Hi, I'm Bob Fisher, and I'm your host today on This is Design Intelligence. Dr. Vinny Nathan currently serves as Auburn University's Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs. In 2011, she joined Auburn University as Dean and McWhorter Chair of the College of Architecture, Design, and Construction. And prior to that, she held teaching positions at Virginia Tech, the University of Michigan, Michigan State University, New York Institute of Technology, and Philadelphia University. On this edition of This is Design Intelligence, she talks about her unique professional path, how her design training helped equip her for academic leadership, and how building trust and goodwill early on kept her from losing the confidence of her faculty after one of the biggest mistakes of her career. Welcome to this edition of This is Design Intelligence, conversations with leadership voices in the built environment. Today on This is Design Intelligence, we want to welcome Vinny Nathan, who is the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. Vinny, welcome to This is Design Intelligence. Good afternoon, Bob. I'm delighted and honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, we are honored to have you, and it's nice to see you again. I think you and I have known each other for about a decade or so. Yes, uh, yes. Mostly through the Design Futures Council and your involvement there um, through Auburn University. Uh, But in this discussion, I want to start by kind of going way back because you've had a a very unique professional experience uh, that not all architects have had, uh, and we want to talk about what that path looked like and what were all the steps on the way. So let's start out pretty early on. What inspired you originally to become an architect? This love for art and design started early in my life. I don't have a single incident or an influence that I can point to because I don't have family members who were in this field or in related fields. I was the first person in my family to pivot to a non-STEM discipline and a non-STEM profession. So I was considered a rebel in my house because I did not want to become a doctor. It, it's an innate interest that I've had, a passion that I've had. And uh, I was delighted as a teenager when I found out that it could actually be a profession. So that was my earliest introduction to design. I just enjoyed looking at spaces that were well-designed and buildings that were well-designed as well. I studied in India to be an architect, and I was told that I should come to the United States to learn how to be an interior designer because being an architect and an interior designer perhaps is the best combination. I came here anticipating to be here in this country for two years. I would work then for two years and go back to India to open my practice. That is not how my life unfolded. Well, what was the turning point then uh, that kept you in the United States? I finished two years at Virginia Tech, and I wanted to work for two years in New York City, and that was in 1990. And at that time, uh, the economy was not doing extremely well. So I found it difficult to have uh, a full-time experience, and my professor asked me to pursue a PhD in architecture at the University of Michigan. So I did that, thinking I would do it for a year or so, and then just Practice would pick up and I would go back, but that did not happen. I loved the the life of an academic. I loved the uh, the domain of ideas, and I found that architecture was about ideas, design was about ideas, and any kind of doctoral study was also about ideas. So for me, that was a serendipitous find, and uh, that's how I got my footing in the academic world. Was there a period of time when you were both in practice and in academia? Yes, yes, I was. And I thought that that is something I would be able to sustain. Uh, Conceptually, it made sense to me in my mind that they both work synergistically, but practically in my life that did not unfold that way. So for me, uh, it became easier. And I just loved the, the, the land of academic activity. And so that's what I did. So where did you go from Michigan? Uh, From Michigan, when I graduated from Michigan, my first uh, tenure track position was at Michigan State for a year. 
And what uh, what is it that you were teaching? What were your responsibilities like? Uh, I I was I was teaching uh, senior design and uh, a design contracts. So those were the two things I was teaching. I was teaching the capstone course for a whole year. I enjoyed being there, and uh, uh, I had a long distance marriage where my husband was in New York, and I thought I should joined him. And so I left that teaching job and came to New York. And uh, uh, when I came there, I practiced and I taught. And that was a exciting time. We were young, we were energetic, and I could do both. And then it got a bit much to sustain both. So that also coincided with us moving to Philadelphia. Did you move to Philadelphia for an opportunity for you or for your husband? For both of us, it was it was more so for him, so it worked out for both of us. And then in Philadelphia, I became a full-time academic, and that was my first kind of step into academic administration, which was never something that was my intent. So there I was from somebody who wanted just to be an architect and interior designer. Then I became a faculty teaching architecture and interior design. And then I became an administrator who did a little bit of teaching. So it became these uh, unintentional pivots in my life that opened up certain pathways. I wish I could stand back right now and say, that it was all planned out, but it wasn't. The one thing I'd like to say that as a person, my personality is to embrace my fear. And every step of my journey, I've always had a little bit of fear. And I felt that it kept my adrenaline up. It made me hungry to learn more. And the kind of iterative processes and this kind of complexity that I learned as a designer and dealing with incomplete information for some folks, that may be paralyzing, but for me, that's been fairly exciting. I've made mistakes because of that, but I've also had some amazing, amazing transformative life experiences, both personally and professionally, because of that attitude that I think got honed in design school. So is it fair to say that you, uh, your training as an architect helped you to design a career, pardon the pun? Uh Maybe, but I would say it was not a linear path. And I'd like to say it went through many iterations and it bounced off many different uh, versions of it. And each version was not perfect, but I've absolutely enjoyed it. Yes. It sounds very much like the design process. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. When you got to Philadelphia, what, uh, what institution were you with and what was your role? Yeah, uh, when I got to Philadelphia, I was at uh, Jefferson Thomas Jefferson University. I was the department chair of the interior design program for 10 years and then became the dean there for four years. So I was there for 14 years. And from there, from Philadelphia, I came to Auburn in 2011 as the dean of the College of Architecture, Design and Construction. So for those who are not uh, in academia who might be listening to this, tell us a bit about what a dean does, mm -hmm. because I can guarantee that most people don't realize the full scope of a dean's responsibilities. The dean's role, depending on the kind of institution that a person is a dean in, could be a little bit different. Having said that, my role as a dean in both my institutions was to do Three things. The first one was uh, to do a lot of external facing activity, which was fundraising. It was also building connections with industry, uh, being visible in national and international arenas that are about thought leadership associated with the discipline. So Design Futures and DFC was right up my alley. It was something which was both my passion and my profession, so it was easy for me to do, and I wish I could continue to do that. So that was a big part of my job. The second piece was uh, understanding money, understanding budgets, understanding academic budgets. It's got a certain degree of complexity. It's got a certain kind of uniqueness that is different from how uh, corporate America may work. And uh, so that's that's the second piece. The third piece of uh, being a dean is uh, personnel matters, which you find in any institution, regardless of what that is. The fourth part of that job, about 10% would be the symbolic and ceremonial. And then the last 10% is this all-encompassing other that is everything that you wish you didn't have to do, but you have to do. <laughs> so, uh, and I think those are actually sometimes the most fertile areas for 
you know, ideation and brain activity because you're dealing with complexity, you're dealing with these wicked problems that are problems within problems, and you're constantly trying to improve stuff. So I think for most designers, that 10% is what keeps us up at night in a really lovely way. When you were in the architecture and design world, did you have the opportunity to lead others? Or was your first opportunity when you went to uh, Philadelphia? I did uh, have a small team when I was in uh, design practice. Uh, it was very hierarchical, so it was a little bit easy and scary in, pr- in the profession because what I said, the folks needed to listen to because the client was paying me the kind of intention or giving me that kind of responsibility. So I had a limited leadership role in practice, but my leadership role actually honed and came into full being in uh, the academic realm. So what was that transition like? I mean, you hadn't really had any training in leadership, right? No, no. And uh, I think academic leadership, particularly in the United States, is extremely unique and wonderful. I am nobody's boss. As an academic leader, you know, we are nobody's boss. We are, we believe in a relatively non-hierarchical kind of leadership. Uh, It is by persuasion. Uh, We believe in shared governance. So we're very committee driven. Uh, Something that I know needs to happen I cannot make it happen without going through extensively scripted processes. And so it's a a flat hierarchy. I have responsibility and leaders have responsibility and authority, but we don't have that kind of uh, mandating kind of power. And in a way, that's the check and balance between the faculty and the administration, which makes U.S. institutions perhaps the best in the world is that kind of shared governance that we have. Well, it sounds like it was either very inclusive or very frustrating. It was both, and I think it was more so the latter. (laughs) But you, it just becomes second nature because you just accept it. We, it sets our expectations in very different ways. uh, And it's a certain personality. You still have to be authentic, but it's not for the faint hearted. Academic leadership is not for the faint hearted. And I think it's never a unilateral decision and it's got multiple stakeholders, most of whom are at odds with each other in terms of what their incentives and what their perspectives are. So how did you develop the ability to influence others when you didn't have authority over them? I had good role models. I had, uh, I went to uh, workshops, I learned from others, and I had people who I would reach out to and ask. So I learned, I continue to learn. Uh, It's an ongoing process. And it's also a certain kind of uh, liking people. I like people, I like helping solve matters. I like having small wins that others can get the credit for. Uh, And uh, it's, it's just, it's, tough, but it's extremely fulfilling. I build up people. I don't build buildings right now in my role. Got it. So let's let's keep going on your path because it hasn't finished yet. So you went from Philadelphia to the Dean of the College of Architecture, Design and Construction at Auburn University. Mm -hmm. And that was in what year? 2011. 2011. And when you got to Auburn, did you have a particular agenda that you wanted to to put in place? Did you have any goals or a vision for the school or for the college? I I did. And I was joining an extremely strong college. And if I may, uh, when I left Philadelphia, I was leaving a college uh, where the college, the university was more than 100 years old, but the College of Architecture and Design was only 18 years old. So in the 18 years, I had been there 14 years for that college's life. So that college was, in my mind, an teenager when I left. So when I came to this this college at Auburn, this college was 107 years old when I joined, uh, just the college, not the university. So I thought I was joining a mature college, and I found that I was joining a teenager here as well. So <laughs> I had to reset, I had to reset some of my own kind of assumptions. And I also had to do certain things alongside with the faculty where there's a lot of infrastructure building 
which I did not anticipate. And that infrastructure building, uh, especially for a mature college, uh, came with its own challenges because there was a sense that that maturity had already bought us a certain kind of, uh, certain kind of standard or quality. And that needed some tending and there was some reluctance to tend to that rebuilding. And, uh, so for me, the, my first vision or my first, uh, order of business was to build trust and to also make sure as being a leader that we try to create no harm. You know, it's, yes, it's not the medical profession, but I think in, in legacy institutions like Auburn, there's always the sense that somebody coming from the outside, and I was considered an outsider because I did not have uh, a degree from Auburn. I had no roots in the entire state of Alabama. So uh, I was the first non-white female uh, dean in the history of Auburn University uh, and in this college. So I try to keep all these first on the side burner and try to be focused in terms of building trust uh, and also uh, try to say that I was there to take something that was solid and help make it better as part of a team. This was never about Winnie Nathan. I never stood in the front lines. I always stood in the sidelines. And I think that it took some time. We had some small wins and those small wins then became slightly bigger and better wins. My vision was to also make sure that this college had graduate programs and had a certain degree of scholarship associated with it. That has taken a good 10, 11 years to happen. And it has been a long, dedicated and patient kind of journey with me and many others. So how did you go about building trust? I mean, you mentioned that you uh, had some initial small wins, uh, and I'm sure that that was very helpful. But what specifically did you do uh, to try to cultivate an environment of trust with the people you were working with? Uh, I tried to see what were the things that could immediately be fixed and try to fix a few of those those things. I also tried to see who were the influencers here amongst the faculty and amongst the donors. Uh, and and at the end of the day, when I had a couple of the donors give me some significant gifts that immediately also signaled to the college and the university that I can build a vision that people can buy into. I found that uh, Auburn University is an extremely proud and ambitious place. And if I tapped into that ambition and said that that was a collective ambition that we all shared, uh, people were willing to invest in that. I was in a position of strength. I was not in a position of weakness. We were not trying to keep the lights on. We were trying to become a better college. Auburn is super competitive, not just in the athletic uh, realm, but also in the academic realm. And I think that for a lot of our graduates, who are also our donors, that was music to their ears. My predecessor did a great job as well, so I want to give credit to that. And so he provided a great platform to which I could come and further elevate the institution and the college. So Vinny, certainly in your journey, uh, especially if you were kind of learning on the job uh, how to be a leader in a complex environment like an academic institution, there must have been some mistakes along the way. Yes, Yes. Uh, uh, and the irony is I made my biggest mistake not paying attention to something that I preach all the time. I have always said, that, and as designers, we are always told that context matters. We pay attention to precedence. We look at what the context is. And I was doing that at Auburn and somehow I think I caught into a mind space where I was uh, either blasé or I thought it I had it all under control and I made a move that was a tactical move, but that just blew up in my face. Uh, and uh, I think if it was somebody else, it could have done them under and they would have lost the confidence of their faculty and they would have lost that role. Uh, in my case, I just think I was a little bit fortunate because I had some goodwill. If I didn't have that goodwill, it happened in my the third year of my deanship. If it happened in the first or second year of my deanship, you and I will not be having this conversation right now. But because it was the third year, I had some points in the bank. And so that kind of helped me. And then I had uh, the leadership at Auburn 
they had the choice of whether to just not support me because it was not politically uh, appropriate or they could support me and they chose to support me and for that i am incredibly grateful i am incredibly grateful it was not a popular thing for the leadership to support me and they did and i'm so glad that at the end of the day what i did worked out for the better of auburn but it was not stylistically it was not a good move i still cannot understand why i did it are you at liberty to tell us what it is uh yeah i just changed the budget model i i changed how people get funds because i thought that there's a different logic and that just blew up in my face and i learned that there are certain limits to how much an institution and a unit can be stressed you know sometimes it's like somebody is pulling small pieces of the bandaid and then you think there's no need to continue at that same pulling let's rip it off so i was pulling it over 2 years and then at the end of the 2 years i thought let me just rip it off and i read that wrong i should have just continue pulling it for another year or another 2 years more i think i just felt i got impatient again it is all on me it was just now it is my personality and i take i take full responsibility for it and i think after that it just made me super small c conservative in some of the things i wanted to do and it took me some time to shake out of that and become again uh, both uh, making these calculated risks it took me some time to get that confidence back again was it a question of not having invested the time to build up consensus around what you wanted to do i mean you're you were making a decision around something that's really fundamentally important to people the resources that they need in order to to do their work and i can imagine that people had a lot of strong feelings around it if you had that to do again is it that you would have spent some more time with people to kind of get them on board or what would that situation have looked like I misread the room. I misread the room. There was one or two people that I should have paid attention to and brought into the fold and socialized the idea. And I there's a small part of my brain that was telling me that and I just ignored it thinking that it didn't matter. And that was what did me under. So in a flat hierarchy, you always have to pay attention to informal influencers mm-hmm. or were the people you're talking about informal influencers who had the ability to rally people to their side or another? Yeah. Well, good lesson learned. Mm-hmm. So the next step that you took in your career, the most recent one, is a seems like a bit of a departure from all the steps you've taken before. The thread, the common thread in all of the uh things that you've done professionally before is that they have some direct relationship to architecture and design but now you're the provost and the SVP for academic affairs for the university so tell us a little bit about first of all what that role does and how it came about for you the provost and SVP for academic affairs when the word uh, provost is an unusual term it's not a well understood position or a title the provost position is the operational or the chief operational officer for the academic side of auburn university that's a title that's used in most institutions in the united states but does not have a comparable equivalent title outside of the us uh, it seems to be very very unique to us institutions and the senior vice president for academic affairs has been around for a long time and so that used to be called you know dean of academic affairs or vice president for academic affairs and then there used to be a dean of faculty long time ago so the dean of faculty has now become the provost and svp for academic affairs so at auburn uh, and at most r1 institutions we are a research one institution we are one of the top 100 institutions in the us so when i keep us in that category uh, that ends up being the number two position in most institutions and it is at auburn uh, and for me it was an unusual step because typically folks who are leading colleges of architecture design and construction do not uh, have the interest or the aptitude uh, to seek this role and oftentimes the competition is not discipline based it's based on the size of colleges that people would have led so you find folks from engineering or if there's a medical school or the law school or the business school 
tends to be the folks who uh, seek this role. So for me, even seeking this role was a little bit unusual. When I look nationally at institutions that have provosts who come from the design fields, there are not many of us. I can count on the fingers of one hand. Uh, I think that at my alma mater, the president many years ago was from the design field. And at the same time, there's somebody at Clemson as well who was also from the design field. And for a long time, many of us looked at the two of them and celebrated that they were from the design fields. And right now, after the two of them have retired, I'm not seeing, you know, outside of specialized design schools, the big R1s, I'm yet to see a president who is from the design fields. But I really feel it's a missed opportunity because the design education just prepares us so naturally for this kind of role. How so? I, I just think that uh, a design education is a fully rounded, comprehensive, almost a renaissance education. Uh, I think Jim Barker, the former president at uh, Clemson, was the person who said that everything from plumbing to poetry, he learned through an architecture education. And I think that these positions like provost expect us to know just enough, not little, just enough about lots of things. And I think designers are by nature and architects are by nature. We are curious people. We like to see what is there. We like to learn new things. For us, nothing is fully solved because we are not in a Cartesian field of two plus two being four and we've solved it and we put it aside. We're constantly looking for improvement. We deal with multiple stakeholders when we are dealing with design problems. And I think all of that is well suited to being in a role like a provost and even a president. Uh, these are complex problems. These are wicked problems. These are problems based on incomplete information. And uh, uh, it's creative problem solving at its best. Well, it sounds like your architecture and design education has suited you well for your current role. So I want to zoom out for a minute and talk about the relationship between the academy and the professions in architecture and design. What do you think that they have to teach one another? I think when I look at the academic side of architecture and design, we act like folks who go into design fields to students who go into majors that are tied to architecture and design. Uh, once they graduate, they can be architects and they can be designers. I think we have to expand that lens to say that they can be leaders. They can hold political office. Uh, they can be leaders at universities. I think law schools are really good about doing that. Business schools are good about doing that as well. I think design schools need to have a slightly broader lens saying that an architecture degree or a design degree is a broad-based renaissance degree that allows you to be an architect if you so choose, but it allows you to go to law school if you want. It allows you to become, go to medical school if you want. It allows you to seek public policy offices if you want. So I would like that to kind of change a little bit. It allows you to be a fantastic architect if, if, if that's your passion, but that broadening of that lens, I think, is needed. A few years ago, I think the prime minister or the president of Greece was an architect. And that was when uh, Greece was going through that financial crisis and everybody thought that there's just no way to think about it. And I remember looking at the news and thinking it's the perfect kind of platform for an architect to, to muddle through those complex problems and try to make a difference. I've not followed on on how successful he was in, in serving the country, but I think that this is where uh, architects can absolutely shine. So the kind of conceiving and the perception around an architectural education both for the public and for prospective students and families. This is a classic liberal arts education in a way. It's a liberal arts education and it's a professional education. So it's the best for both worlds. Uh, we know how to speak because of the crits. We know how to write. We know how to diagram. We know how to present graphically. Uh, so I think there's so much that just comes through that kind of education. So what are some other things that, let's say, the profession could learn from academia? Uh, I think that the profession from the academic side should perhaps look at what the other professions, particularly the profession of law 
and engineering uh, is uh, that kind of uh, anticipating the future 20 and 30 years down and also be able to work with influential agencies like governmental agencies uh, have that kind of lobbying power i think the architecture profession is is doing a little bit of that i want to be fair to them but when i see some of for example when i see uh, my colleagues in construction for example it's a very closely allied field so in construction they are politically active in being able to influence policy in uh, being able to influence funding in being able to showcase the importance of a design uh, design thinking in general, the whole kind of steam spectrum rather than STEM, uh, about the importance of uh, that kind of creative thinking in the K through 12 schools. I love the STEM fields, but I really wish we don't act like the whole world should just be STEM focused. And I think that's where the, the profession needs to kind of ramp up a little bit of what they are doing. If you could go back and visit 19-year-old Vinny, what advice would you give her? I would ask that she travels more. I wish I had taken a gap year or gap years between my undergraduate and graduate studies. I did not take a gap because I was scared that I won't go back to school. And my parents just fed into that kind of anxiety that I shouldn't have a break. I wish I had a little bit more maturity by traveling. So I wish I had done that. I also wish that I had, as a student in the graduate program and in the undergraduate program, I spent all my time in the studio and I wish I had not spent as much time in the studio. I think I could have embraced the rest of the university and the rest of the experiences that were there. I went to the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. That was the time that we had an amazing football team and we had an amazing basketball team and we had amazing performance come to town. And I didn't embrace all of that. And I just feel uh, I could have I could have, it was right there at my fingertips for the taking and I did not. And so those were the things I would ask the naive and uninformed Vinnie Nathan, who was 19, 20, 21, 22 and beyond to embrace a lot more now. Yeah. Well, your journey has certainly been a very inspiring one. Uh, and this conversation has been really enlightening about how those who are involved in architecture and design might expand their influence into all sorts of other areas and leverage the way that they think and the way that they solve problems. I can't go. I would not give up this, this educational journey for anything in the world. I think I made the best decision deciding to pursue my undergraduate degree in architecture. Well, Vinny, thank you so much for being with us on This is Design Intelligence. Uh, best of luck with your uh, new role uh, as provost at Auburn University. Thank you so much, Bob. It's an absolute pleasure and thrill, and I look forward to seeing you in person some other time. Thank you for joining us for this edition of This is Design Intelligence. The producer is Laura Spells. The sound engineer is Jared Knabel. This has been a DI Media Group production.